Thanks very much. Hello, and very warm welcome to this What If session. Thanks for joining me here on the floor. Um, just to give you a bit of an idea of the format, I'm planning to spend about 10 minutes just talking, um, followed by a few minutes kind of reflecting on some images that I'd like to share with you. Um, then I'm going to show a short film and conclude, and then we can open it up to a discussion, because it'd be brilliant to hear some of your views, which is usually where the uh, more interesting things start to happen. So today I'm going to be talking about a wearable future set in the context of money. Although with just half an hour for this presentation, I hope you'll be kind enough to bear in mind that money is a subject which has inevitably raised far more what-if questions throughout its protracted history than it will ever be able to answer. Throughout civilization, people have ostentatiously displayed their wealth and some of their most valued possessions about their person in clothing, jewelry, and other wearable objects and adornments. So it is with this in mind, from this wearable starting point, that I would like to introduce the concept for my current research project called Money No Object. Alongside sex and war, money has remained steadfast and constant throughout human history. But now, in the 21st century, the object of money is fast becoming immaterial. Coins, cash, and credit cards are arguably obsolete, as digital representations of currency and virtual monies are increasingly substituting the physical tokens of exchange. Yet, while trading relies on trust, how do we trust what we cannot tangibly experience, what we can no longer touch, see, smell, or hear? Adopting a broad line of inquiry, Money No Objects seeks to question these prevailing concepts of value, while playfully exploring alternative economic ideas through the lens of wearable technology, user experience, and most importantly, human-focused design interaction. It considers, for example, a new significance for material and physical currencies in an increasingly immaterial world where smart payment transactions are imperceptible but human emotions, creativity, and culture remain aspects of society that money still can't buy. In essence, the project reimagines the physical manifestation of money, exploring what could happen if physical <coughs> transactions offered a different kind of value proposition, and if, in a new creative economy, these transactions could trigger invaluable and more enriching points of exchange. For more than 4,000 years, objects representing a given value have pervaded and often dominated human exchanges and interaction through the history of money. Coins in particular are collected in part for the value of their stories, <coughs> these tiny canvases onto which artists have inscribed power and politics, carved global events, and cast national identity. The crafted artwork of a coin is an enduring social documentary, ubiquitous, universal, yet barely noticed as a form of mass communication. From the depths of oceans or wishing wells, <coughs> at the bottom of your bag or pocket, coins are pervasive, continually on a journey and imbued with meaning as they travel between people and places at points of trade or chance. The intimacy and intricacy of these tactile, portable, hand-engaging objects is drafted on a scale immaterial to their significant influence. Coins are frequently attributed to <coughs> talismanic power, made into jewellery and worn for luck or protection, determining fate at a flip, or blessed by the sovereign and given as healing arms. Similarly, Digital technology has assumed a compelling and mysterious power beyond itself with an arbitrarily attributed value, the appetite for which, like money, would appear to be insatiable. Everywhere and nowhere, this elusive form of mass communication is equally universal, portable, pervasive, a nebulous hub around which humans connect and interact. Take two news reports from China, for example, the second largest economy in the world. One couple last year paid a record fine of 1.3 million yuan, which equates to about 133,000 pounds, for the privilege of having a second child. Then there was the teenager who sold one of his kidneys in order to buy an iPhone and an iPad. 
he had been recruited for this illegal trade through an online chat room. These two extreme cases expose all too clearly how the value of life, the value of digital technology, and the metaphorical cost of living in the 21st century has become problematic. Compare this with the persistent uncertainty about the price of commodities, dubious stock market trading with uncontrollable algorithms at the helm, and undiminished speculation and instability over Bitcoin. Inherent within all this financial anxiety is both angst and fervor for all things digital and the indeterminate impact of technological advances on future monetary systems. This time last year, as Google lost $24 billion in approximately eight minutes, the issues surrounding a digital and creative economy have never been more acute. Ultimately, however, it is undoubtedly the people and the ideas, the human interactions and personal connections which form the vital resources needed to drive technology and communications forward and to drive innovation, determining in the process how and what we will value in future. In the midst of all this angst between losing kidneys and losing billions, I would suggest it is an equally relevant time to consider the concept of money as it is constantly in question and to reimagine it altogether, temporarily setting aside the burden of fiscal responsibility in order to refresh and re-engage our attitudes and to inspire new conversations about future currencies, whether these will be physical objects, digital representations, or continue to form a combination of both. So this is essentially the story of change. Of course, it is not possible to eliminate material coinage or cash until there is a globally accessible alternative. Yet while trading relies on trust and money remains a belief system, the intersection of future digital technologies with tangible currency, that is essentially any object representing a stated believable value, remains precarious. As Nick Harkaway observes in The Blind Giant, Being Human in a Digital World, if we want to establish trust, we need to experience touch. And surely he means a feeling beyond the flat, cold sensation of the touchpad or screen. <laughs> Smart, connected objects, the so-called Internet of Things, and wearable technologies must consider the object of money, even if there is a possibility that money will become no object. So now I just wanted to share a few images um, of different influences on my thinking in this area, as well as some pictures of my own work where I've tried to articulate some of these ideas. Um, the first is a painting by Quentin Mansis. Um, it's called A Money Lender and His Wife, which although the title indicates that it's about their relationship, I think it's interesting how they seem to be kind of completely oblivious of one another and focusing entirely on the pile of coins and money in their possession. The second image shows a woman known as the Amma, or Mother of India, who travels the world hugging people. Thousands of people queue for hours to receive a hug from Amma, and it's often described as a spiritual experience. You may have seen it on Louis Theroux, who uh, experienced a hug from Amma. This is Marina Abramovich at the Museum of Modern Art in 2010, in her show called The Artist is Present. David Graeber's book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years. <laughs> Not sure about the sequel. <coughs> a series of wearable window boxes called pret a Ponte for taking nature into the sterile office <laughs> environment and into the industrial <coughs> landscape. A wearable surveillance device called a Panopticam which incorporates a miniature video camera, which you see the lens in the center reflecting that, into a dome-shaped mirrored brooch. So you can spy on everyone else as uh, CCTV and surveillance is spying on you. And lastly, the bacteria present on a 10 pence coin from a recent project called Financial Growth. <laughs> 
So just um, before concluding, I'd like to show a short film which illustrates the concept and context for Money No Object and demonstrates wearable prototypes in action. And this project was part of a craft and technology residency which took place at the base of Media Studio in Bristol earlier this year. So, uh, My name is Heidi Heiner and I'm an artist and maker. My background is in uh, jewellery and silversmithing and literature. So um, both these two subjects often influence my practice. I've always wanted the objects that I make to trigger and create experiences. That's obviously proved quite difficult to do independently. So the craft and technology residency seemed like an amazing opportunity to realize that. My project is called Money No Object, and I've been looking at the um, role that physical currency plays and how it might become obsolete in the future. And maybe if it does become obsolete with the rise of digital currencies, what we might therefore value instead and in its place. The theme of money is a huge subject in itself. Every day there's a new news report that's relevant to finance, um, currency, the global economic situation. And alongside a lot of reading and research, I've also tried to adopt an approach through making of making things fast and thinking through making. of the objects I've been making um, have been based on wearable technologies and the idea that you may be able to make a financial transaction through a physical gesture. So I've looked at four different physical gestures, one being a hug, um, so that's been called hug and pay, one a handshake, a traditional handshake, which is the gentleman's agreement, a high five, and also tap and pay, play on words, which is where um, a tap dance could basically trigger a payment transaction. And I've gone about this by using RFID technology, um, that's the same technology which you find in Oyster Cards. So using a reader and a tag, the two parts, and I'm currently making, for example, the hug and pay, two brooches, one which a vendor might wear with the reader and one which a customer might wear, incorporating the tag. And the two people, in order to make the payment, have to hug and touch the brooches together in that gesture. <laughs> I think increasingly with the rise of digital currencies, there's less opportunity to interact and communicate with humans. Um, for example, there may be no need in the future for a high street bank, and therefore the opportunities to go and just have a chat with someone um, and interact are decreasing. So the idea with the physical gestures of payment, the hug and pay, and the handshake, those bring back a certain physical interaction and an opportunity for humans to engage in touch, which often sort of digital technology doesn't allow. The opportunity to work with Dan Williams, a creative technologist, and within the Basic Media Studio in a collaborative way has been really valuable. It's something that I haven't had the opportunity to do before, and he's just been so supportive of someone who is a complete novice in this field. My role in the project is to work with Heidi to explore technology in the practice, um, whether that's finding existing solutions, technical solutions, or writing custom software, putting together hardware. Collaborations like this between craftspeople and technologists are valuable because currently much of the uh, discussions and themes about the Internet of Things are very much driven by technology and business. So it's uh, frequently about efficiency and not so much about um, the material or what to do with it or how it relates to people. So I've been thinking about the context in which these transactional gestures might take place. And of course, at the moment, it wouldn't be possible for that to happen in an everyday context as much. So having experimented around watershed, I was thinking of the value that it might be to have 
an alternative payment system like this within a cultural institution, perhaps kind of reinventing the clear plastic donations box that you often see in museum foyers. People would perhaps purchase the wearable objects as limited to edition collectibles, for example, in the museum gift shop, um, and then they would load up the RFID tag with credit to spend within that building and within that organisation. And they would do that by perhaps hugging a cashier to hug and pay or gaining some alternative emotional value um, to their payment transaction. This residency was really about starting a process of bringing together craft and technology, which I hadn't had the opportunity to do before. And it feels like the beginning of a vast body of research, which I'd like to continue with. And it's hard to express how much I've learned during this short time. It's been very intensive, but really fortifying in terms of confidence and in terms of opportunities for new ways of working. By applying digital technology in this new context, my main aim was to try to bring people closer together through the use of connected wearable devices. As technology concentrates on efficiency, speed and maximum convenience, human social needs are all too often neglected. At the point of an electronic transaction, the focus is entirely on the technology as we, try to, as we type in a PIN number or wave a contactless card and all parties avoid eye contact for added security. This disregard for human interaction, the inevitable absorption in our smart devices and the hiding behind screens, is a worrying trend as loneliness and social isolation become a silent epidemic, while ironically we are more connected than ever before. Money is a bond, a system of exchange and communication, a tacit agreement of trust, so is a handshake and even more so a hug. With these alternative methods of making a payment donation, I'm endeavouring to raise questions about value in the long term, what it is and how it might evolve in future. So what if wearable technology could enable a particularly potent currency, that of human sensory experience, and could address at least some of our social and emotional needs for the foreseeable and wearable future? Thanks very much for your attention. I'd be really happy to hear any questions or thoughts that you may have, and um, I'd like to just open it up to a discussion format then. Thank you. And please keep in touch. Any questions? It's that awkward moment where people are going to say hello. Yeah. <laughs> Not really a question, but maybe um, it needs to, to get a clarification on that. Uh, if, if I got your, your point right, you try to replace, uh, or you're thinking about replacing traditional currency by something that is electronic, but at the same time tries to enhance physical interactions between the partners in the, uh, in the contact transaction. Yes. In which way is that so fundamentally different than giving a metal coin to somebody else? And receiving the yes, the, the context is very much focused on a donation, so charitable giving, I guess, more about altruism than in a capitalist society is very much more kind of egotism where they're two sides of the same coin. So as you're giving, I suppose, it's encouraging people to think about that um, outward-looking exchange, really, of value <coughs> and the fact that human communication and human interaction is a value in itself. So I guess giving someone a physical object, you're not actually 
engaging in any physical touch or any sort of um, personal exchange as such. You're merely passing an object between your hands. Have I understood your Yeah, you question? understood it right. The answer yeah. is also in line. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Um, can you imagine a, a sort of a dystopian version of this where kind of confidence tricksters trick people into hugging them or um, <laughs> accidentally paying <coughs> them to steal a dent and going straight for sort of dystopia as I tend to do? Can you imagine this? How would you kind of manage that sort of interaction? Yeah, really interesting. I think often questions about the future and projections into the future are generally dystopian. So I think I was trying to hopefully offer something. Um, Bit more optimistic, but I totally agree. You know, obviously, there's always the minority who will spoil it for the majority. Um, I guess by citing the, the donation system and this, this particular version of exchange within something like a museum environment or an organization, then you're kind of introducing it into a kind of um, an ecosystem that's established and perhaps may have its own sort of security measures. Um, but I agree, I mean, it would be interesting in a way to see just as much how people sort of interact with that um, and I'd like to kind of have the opportunity to do some more user testing to see how that might take a sort of certain route whether that's negative or positive um, yeah it's a really good question to which I don't really have a <laughs> <laughs> how to stop people being naughty <laughs> yeah hi yeah, I'm curious about the, the title for the project because to me, um, it seems that you're sort of replacing one sort of object, actually, with the other types of objects. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that the, the chicken has to be embedded into a shoe or into a brooch or into something. So I'm kind of curious why, why you chose that title and if you really do see the object being um, kind of dissolved or whether it's just sort of being displaced with other objects. Really. And there's like a, an intense physicality to it with your, your kind of... Um, describing which is incredibly material. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the um, the title is intentionally ambiguous really in order to raise questions about the immateriality of digital impact and digital technology um, alongside the fact that I'm trying to retain, as you say, um, a sort of truth to physicality and uh, human contact and touch. Um, so there's a sort of, I guess, reversible element in the title that's um, intentional. Does that answer? Yeah, I just, I, I personally found this slightly misguiding or confusing that maybe perhaps if there's a question mark, then it would sort of feel like kind of relate more to what you're actually presenting. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah there definitely is meant to be a question mark, I oh, guess, okay. without, you know, literally uh, adding in the grammar. Um, <laughs> Hi, have you thought much about um, sort of multiple digital currencies, time sharing, and how that has that been part of your research? Um, no, can you expand on that a bit more? Multiple um, digital currencies? Yeah, so that we all have like a global digital currency, but then we also have more localised ones depending on your area. So you okay. Time share. Like Bristol Pound or yeah. Bristol Pound? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And also the, um, Mm, yeah, interesting. Um, this is where I probably feel I should be more of an economist to answer the question <laughs> adequately. Um, I, I suppose if, you know, looking far into the future, I almost imagine, um, as Verity is saying, a kind of dystopian view that perhaps there will be one central currency for the whole planet um, with, you know, as you say, sort of micro-currencies and people trying to kind of keep their... Um, economy going on a more regional basis, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have an answer. So I don't, I don't know whether that's good or bad. Basically, yeah. <laughs> so it's not very really good to answer. <laughs> I haven't really thought about it. So. Um, maybe another another point. So you, you try to increase the physical contact between persons or, or to give again some uh, some physicality in, uh, in the transaction. I'm just a little bit wondering if it really is the right place 
get this kind of physical contact when you are doing a financial transaction? I mean, to me it sounds a bit like, you know, in a way, prostitution. <laughs> this work. Um, you know, I mean, there are many areas where I totally agree that we are losing, you know, human contact and we're texting to our friends instead of calling them or, or visiting them in, in person. But is it truly the right place in the physical to have this physical interaction in a, in a, in a financial transaction? Yes, I suppose um, I'm approaching it in a sort of research context and in an imaginative way, really, just kind of um, seeking to raise questions and start discussions because I think people are very burdened by the subject of money. And, um, you know, in, in the news and the media, it's always kind of a, a heavy going subject because it's never very positive in a recession. Um, but I think. Um, it's, it's something that could be, it's difficult to reimagine and to refresh your vision of it because, in a sense, everyone uses money. It's had such a long history, four or five thousand years. How do you re engage with it that takes it totally apart from everything you've already experienced and learnt and feel that you already know about it? So, I guess it's trying to remove all those preconceptions, putting it into a completely new context. Um, and, and playing around with that really, not necessarily trying to in any way introduce this into um, a nation that sort of needs to hug and handshake in order to pay. <laughs> I don't want to you know, control people. To, it's offering something, I guess, for people to respond to and to think about. Hi. Hi. I have a comment really, not a question. Mm -hmm. But I just, I actually, I kind of think this is a really lovely way to think about you know, bringing humanity and bringing the human side back to financial transactions. Um, so I actually think, and looking across the whole conference, the places that are so, I think, almost the opportunities that exist are the ones that bring humanity back to technology, that you know, kind of create whimsy and fun, mm -hmm. and not just like, what's the business? Mm -hmm. um, so I just. I didn't know what to expect, but I really, I thought it was a really interesting take. Thank you. So, yeah. No questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that, that's definitely it, is trying to kind of be fun rather than trying to say this is a payment system. Right, right. You're not preventing. like replacing coin. No, exactly. So. Huh. Yeah, sort of uh, kind of along the same lines, I think that it does create this sense of whimsy and fun. But I also wonder, there's sort of a, a transfer of value almost when this when you see a lot of repetition of these kind of behaviors that, that you saw in the, in the study, where the value is ch ch changing from sort of an intrinsic value of a hug or these physical exchanges into a monetary value, right? And almost could be detracting from the p real personal value of these you know, interactions, which really have no financial value in a normal setting. So I'm wondering just, I know this isn't meant to be replicated for long term or you know, in the, in the public markets necessarily, but just during the course of your experiments, did you see sort of um, any emotional changes occurring when people were repeating these motions, at, you know, ad, ad nauseum for your the purpose of your video and experiments? Um, I, I guess I haven't had enough chance to do sort of more extensive user testing to be able to answer that well. Um, I, I would definitely be interested in seeing if there was any kind of um, sociological or anthropological kind of research that could come from watching that. Because, for example, I imagine that more children might go to donate by using a hug, whereas perhaps older people and probably British people would choose a handshake, which is more formal and um, less, less sort of contact. So I think you know, it might be interesting to see how the different physical gestures were viewed and, as you say, kind of perhaps played with or played upon more or less um, would definitely be interesting. Um, there is a fine line, obviously, between the financial value being placed on top of that physical gesture, um, which is not what I'm trying to kind of um, address in any way, really. And that's why it's important to me that, in a sense, it, it stays as a donation system, as um, charity or um, something a little more about giving and, and helping people again to reconsider money in that context, rather than um, which, which I guess suits the gestures. I can answer that slightly. We were lucky enough to have Heidi in the studio where I work for the duration of the residency. Um, 
would have been normal for you, but for us it was very strange that every every so often you would hear a little beep where Heidi was testing with someone, and it would always be followed by a, a ripple of, of sort of giggling and kind of charming enthusiasm throughout the studio. People looked around to see what this kind of very um, till-based, cash-based noise was doing, and discovered that there were some people having a hug or having a handshake. It, it was a, a very kind of charming way of looking at the transaction that, that kind of um, opened up lots of questions. And that line for me, it would be curious to see how uh, different cultures would react to that. Different what, sorry? Different cultures react mm -hmm. to yes. that. For, exa uh, for example, um, when Arabic people uh, who have a different way of communicating with each other would respond to that. And also, um, when I was in Hong Kong, they had uh, some kind of hug day, and I'm pretty large. So <laughs> then I went to them and gave them a hug, and they really looked a bit like, okay, is this okay or not? Because I was not of the local people uh, mm -hmm. living there. So I'm really curious how it will evolve and yeah, different kind of cultures are involved with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. I'd really love to see a version where in the sort of the old cultural fashion, how many kisses do you do? And the more kisses you do, the money expenditure. <laughs> <laughs> I think then the Dutch would win. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. <laughs> Three kisses, yeah. <laughs> yes, just a comment as well. I think it's, you know, it's a lovely project, and thank you for sharing it. And I think kind of like two different things you know, together, and the two are really valuable, and I don't know what, you know, the connection is necessarily all the time, you know. I love the idea of dematerializing money, and, you know, I love the exploration into, oh, come on, there are so many different ways of paying, and why are we doing it all the same way? Mm -hmm. But I also think on the other side, the probably forcing it through the high interaction route, you know, it will kind of close so many possibilities that we could be exploring, like, mm -hmm. you know, we pay, if you think about it, we pay the same way for something at the grocery shop, like a very expensive item. Mm -hmm. You know, and we all relate to the same either a click or, you know, contact payment or a card. Mm -hmm. So if you start to think about, you know, when we shop from, uh, for groceries, we're in a rush, you know, we shop, you want, I charge you always that I need to want to, don't want to give anybody a hand, you just want to get away really quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, or if you yeah. want to have more a conversation with the person at the store and kind of like engage into the purchase of what you're doing in a different way. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to think about how we shop for things and not mm -hmm. to think that, you know, that way that we know it's the only way of doing it and explore different interactions in that sense. Yeah, very definitely. Yeah, I think context is all potentially and um, alongside sort of cultural and, and even personal character it comes into that sort of <coughs> context in a sense that I mean, not everyone wants to be hugged or wants to give a hug, um, and certainly some people don't want to break into a tap dance, for example. <laughs> um, so I think you know all those things could be um, an opportunity, I suppose, for different gestures, different applications, and different <coughs> for the same concept. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.